my mother and my dad always stressed education. I think they were somewhat disappointed when I decided uh, that I was going to go into the, into the Navy. I always felt uh, it was something to give back for the opportunity to put a, you know, for what I had been given. I was the first to finish high school in our generation of, of kids, and I was the first to go to college uh, and graduate. I graduated number two in the School of Electrical Engineering. I was being recruited in 1960 uh, as an electrical engineer. By the time I got my, my wings as a designated a, a Navy aviator, for me, I, I was a, uh, achieving a lifelong dream flying these high-performance high airplanes. It, it was a confidence builder. My fellow American, as I speak to you tonight, air action is now in execution. I, I woke up, it was around 10 a.m., and it was the duty officer who told me I, you know, I was going on a mission. We had been attacked, and President Johnson, we were told, just got on the air on television and told the nation that in retaliation, we were launching strikes. Our flights of A-4s was assigned to target Hot Bay, which was north of High Fall. Our flight time would take another two hours to get to our target. When you go through an experience like that, it's, you, you tend to remember every, every detail, every second uh, for the rest of your life. I, I, I remember as we were flying towards the target at altitudes, and it was a beautiful, clear day, and thinking about what I was doing, I was flying wing on Nottingham, who was leading the flight of what, 10 A4s, and uh, I, I had a realization that we were going to war. Here it was, open warfare. We were actually going to war, and I said, holy smokes, yeah. We went straight in, and as we got closer and closer, things began to come into view. All of a sudden, he said, good God, shoot, and he broke off, and so I fired. I broke right, and then I called out. I lined up inside the entrance to the harbor. I couldn't believe that the whole sky around me had just turned black and flat. I was nervous when we first started to come in. What surprised me was that once things started happening, I wasn't nervous at all. It was calm. I was maneuvering through the flag. I could see the tracers flying back. I could see the flag going off all around me. And even though I had fired all my rockets, I switched to my 20 millimeter guns. Everything that we were doing was the result of years of training. Everything was within reach, flipping this, turning that switch. And it was uh, like a choreographed musical, in a way. And then I got hit. Right off the bat, smoke started coming up. Every warning indicator came up. I was losing control and I was trying to get up. And I was broadcast at the same time that I've been hit. Nick's voice came up. Do you know what to do, Al? My first thought was, like, what? <laughs> But uh, I said, yeah. And I said, I'll, I'm getting out. I'll see you guys later. And, uh, I, and I went out and hit the airstream, pinned my arms back and my legs. And, uh, it was a projectile flying through the air. And then I felt this little shoe pop, and then the big one pop, and then not even a full swing. I was in the water. And when I came up, I had to take it off my helmet, getting rid of my parachute. And the first thing I thought about is I was in the water. I was. I was saying, oh my God, what's my poor wife going to do? What's my mom going to do? And then the next thing I know, there's some bullets are whizzing by me. I look around and here, I'm surrounded. Uh, and all these rifles are pointing at me. I, I thought for sure they're going to kill me. But they didn't. And they hauled me aboard and then I was taken back to the base, which we had just bombed. And one of my first interrogations, I was taken in by two officers. Gave him my name, rank, service number, date of birth. Well, I said, well, according to the Geneva Agreements, that's what, what I'm supposed to give you. And they talked to each other and he said, there's no war. Uh, there's no declaration of war. You're not a prisoner of war. And you don't have that status. And I thought about it as he said that and I said, you know, <laughs> he's right. 
They transferred me to Hanoi uh, a few days later. Everything started to come into realization that I was going to have to deal with this whole situation myself. I was not going to get any help. I had no idea what was going to happen next, and that continued and continued for a while. Prayed a lot. Uh, that was an important part. Uh, I recognized that I had to keep my mind occupied. My first year, 13 months, uh, I was by myself, no matter what I had to go through. When I came out of that, I wanted to be able to look at myself in the mirror and not be ashamed. You make it known to your captors that uh, you're not going to give in easily. But you don't t take it to the point where you can't bounce back. And so the key was to bounce back. And people would say, well, why even do that? Well, if you don't do that, and if you don't you know, show resistance, in, in effect is that your soul is lost. It was a totally different because we, I, was, I was with fellow Americans and we were all in a, in a group. And even when we had to go through harsh, harsh treatment, uh, it, was, it was part of a, of, a, of a community of guys that uh, we were all in the same boat together. So our legs were shackled to the iron bars and, and we were handcuffed behind our back and we used uh, the uh, buckets. The bucket was our, our, our bathroom, and, but we found ourselves at some point just thought this is so ridiculous and we started, couldn't stop laughing. We just kept laughing about our situation. I remember Redberg saying, my wife's never going to believe this. Once a day they'd feed us, they could unhandcuff you and let you eat while your feet were shackled. If a person was taken out of his cell, uh, going to interrogation, you said a prayer for him because you never know if you'd see him again. Uh, and then you would say, thank God it's not me this time. You know, we had been through the mill. I'd been through the mill time after time after time and punished in one way or another. And, uh, and, and this time the guard actually started hitting me with the rifle butt. I went back to my cell and my face was bloody. Dick Ratzlaff was my cellmate. And I could tell by his reaction that I was uh, puffed up and what have you. And I said, look, Dick, it's not that bad. It's like playing football, you know, you get yourself beat up, and but it, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt. It was exhilarating. The bombing had already stopped, the war and everything. We were all taken out into uh, the prison yard and they read us the peace accords, how we were going to be released and, and go home when I was going to, going to be in that first group. He, of course, the first one shot down. In a way, it was over, long overdue as far as I was. So emotionally, I was just uh, somewhat cynical in the sense that, oh God, we've gone through this before. They resumed the bombing and all that. Uh, but this time they gave us clothing, they gave us shoes, they gave us a little bag and we could keep our little knickknacks. And the next day they, we lined up and they marched us out. We got uh, on the buses finally, got on the buses. Uh, there was uh, the ride, the ride to the uh, to the airport, where I, at any point we felt that peace talks had fallen through, and they were going to turn around and take us back. And, you know, and the plane starts rumbling down the, the runway, and as it lifts off, they just erupted in a, in a roar. All the guys, we made it. It was instant celebrity. We were thrust into the limelight. I was thrust into the limelight which was not really fair. I met my current wife. Things happened rapidly. When, in talking to the younger generation, I've always encouraged them to establish your goals, work hard, and don't let failure stop you. Everybody fails. Find those things that you enjoy doing, that you want to do, and work hard.